Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. For the last couple of days, we've been plowing through some really tough terrain that's led up to the fall of Judah in 586 BC. And if you're still listening after the last couple of days, thanks so much for persevering. I know it's not been easy, and hopefully today is far more encouraging and uplifting. Today we find ourselves in a happier time of Judah's history. We're actually going back in time as we're actually going forward in the Bible and moving into 1 Chronicles. 1 and 2 Chronicles are similar books to 1 and 2 Kings. Like 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles were originally one book, maybe just divided because they needed to put all this stuff on a two different scrolls so they wouldn't have one giant scroll. Both focused on the period when kings led the people of God, and both are going to pretty much going to lead us down this sad march to the exile. There are some differences, though, between 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles. For instance, 1st Chronicles focuses on the life of David, where 1st King barely touches upon the life of David, because you'll remember that was really in 2nd Samuel, and 1st King just touches upon David's reign and then goes into the reign of Solomon. Likewise, 1st and 2nd Kings ping-pongs back and forth between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, and there's a lot of focus on the northern kingdom, while 1st and 2nd Chronicles barely touches upon the northern kingdom. First Chronicles begins with a long list of genealogies that goes all the way back to Adam in verse 1 of chapter 1. First and Second Kings has very little genealogical data at all. The tone also is different between the two books. First and Second Kings give us kind of the raw data of what transpires, just like just the facts, ma'am. It's just kind of just straight up, here's what happened. First and Second Chronicles will often interpret that data in light of the work of God. And so at times, you'll find that First and Second Chronicles is far more uplifting than First and Second Kings, and sometimes you'll even find it more pointed or more condemning as like, hey, this was the problem right here. And so these differences between the two books comes from the difference of intention. The intention of First and Second Chronicles is to remind God's people of their spiritual foundation as a nation. You'll remember that God has made a covenant with his people, and he's faithful to his covenant. And that covenant says that the Israelites were the chosen people of God, that God made a covenant with Adam, that God made a covenant with their forefather Abraham, that God made a covenant with them through Moses, and that God made a covenant with their king David. And all that has happened in their history, from the division of the kingdom to the exile, that was simply a matter of God being faithful to his side of the covenant. The implication then is, just as God was faithful to his covenants to bring the judgment upon them that he had warned them about, He was also going to be faithful to his covenant to also bring the forgiveness that he promised as well. Now, hopefully you've already read 1 Chronicles 17, and it probably sounded familiar with you. And that's because what we're reading about in 1 Chronicles 17, we've already learned about in 2 Samuel 7, which recounts the same event. This is God's covenant he makes with David. And although we've already discussed this event, I've included it in our key chapters because it's a super important covenant. And the more we understand it, the better we're going to understand God's word. In fact, if you're listening to this in real time, then again, today is Palm Sunday. And Palm Sunday is the event where Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, and the crowds of the people were shouting, Hosanna, son of David. Remember, they were laying down those palm branches before him. Now, why were they doing all of that? Well, they were declaring that Jesus was the son of David. They're laying down the palm branches because those are just like kind of the Israeli uh, national flag. And Matthew 21, 5 says, this took place to fulfill what was prophesied when he quotes Isaiah and Zechariah saying, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. And so the joy that people had when Jesus rode in Jerusalem was because they realized he was fulfilling so many biblical prophecies, including the prophecies here to David in 1 Chronicles 17. So this is an important passage, even for understanding of the New Testament. Let's go ahead and dive on in. Here we are in 1 Chronicles 17. The year is approximately 1042 BC. David has just brought the ark into the temple. That was back in chapter 16. And in chapter 16, there's just this great prayer of dedication. And then chapter 17 opens with David just kind of scratching his head, looking at the situation and realizing, hey, I got this whole home thing, but the ark is in a tent. So he thinks he should build a temple for the ark. He tells Nathan, the prophet, about it, and and at first Nathan's like, yeah, it's a good idea, but then the Lord goes back to Nathan and says, no, 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 let him know i got other plans for him. And so Nathan comes back to David and gives this incredible promise and covenant on behalf of God in verses 4 to 14. Let's look at what these promises say. Starting in verse 4, God tells David he should not build a temple. He reminds David how he has walked with his people for all these centuries without a table, and God has not established David for this purpose. He actually has a much higher purpose for David. 
And so he unfolds this purpose in verses 7 to 14, and he gives David eight key promises. Now, if you're the kind of person who writes in your Bible, then I would encourage you at this point to draw a circle or a triangle or, or something, maybe a box, underlining each time the phrase, I will, occurs in these verses. You should find this phrase, I will, in verses 8, verse 9, verse 10, verse 11, verse 12, verse 13, verse 14, pretty much every verse. And they can be summarized in these eight one-word promises that I'm going to give to you, all starting with the letter P. Some of the alliteration is a bit strained, but I think it overall works. So let's look at these eight promises. The first one occurs in verse 8, which I'm calling the promise of prominence. You'll find this promise in the second half of verse 8, where God says, I will make you a name like the name of the great ones who are in the earth. Just a promise of prominence. The second promise is a promise of place in verse 9. He says, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them. So God's just going to give them this place, this land, this promised land. The third promise was for peace in verse 10. He says at the end of verse 10, I will subdue all your enemies. And that's just a promise of peace with them. The fourth promise is in verse 11, and I'm calling this the promise of posterity. The Lord promises, he says, I will set up one of your descendants after you who will be one of your sons, and I will establish his kingdom. That promise is closely tied to the fifth promise in verse 12, which I'm calling the promise of production. That's a bit strained, I get it. But the Lord is saying his son, his his posterity will build for him, the Lord, a temple, a house, and I will establish his throne forever. The sixth promise is what I'm calling paternity, and that's from verse 13, where the Lord says, I will be his father, and he shall be my son. The seventh is also in verse 13, where the Lord says, I will not take my loving kindness away from him, and I'm calling that the promise of permanence. And the eighth promise, the final promise, is that of a perpetual kingdom, and that's in verse 14, where the Lord says, I will settle him in my house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forever. So once again, God promised David these eight promises. First, in verse 8, prominence. Second, in verse 9, a place for his people. Third, verse 10, peace with his enemies. Fourth, verse 11, posterity, who would produce the temple, in verse 12. Likewise, paternity for this descendant and a permanent love towards him, in verse 13. And this one will have a perpetual kingdom, in verse 14. And so these are tremendous promises that unfolded in the life of David and ultimately through David's descendants. And yet we've also just finished reading First and Second Kings, and it's clear from reading those books that, that all does not go well, that, that there is just a real problem because David's descendants just get further and further away from following the Lord, and it is clear they did not fulfill these promises. So Israel's kings begin with such a hopeful optimism with David, but they end with such disappointing disobedience with Zedekiah. And Chronicles has been written after all of those events have transpired. Now, traditionally, Chronicles is believed to be written by Ezra somewhere around 430 BC. At this point, all the kings have fallen. The exile has already begun. In fact, the return has also begun. But at this point, people can barely remember the good times. And so Ezra, the author here, just wants to remind the people of God what he has promised to David all the way back in 1042 BC and how what has happened was ultimately a part of God's plan all along. And so here's the cool thing. Again, if you're listening to this today on Palm Sunday, then I also want to remind you of an important prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, which was also written by the time 1 Chronicles 17 was written. Daniel's prophecy in chapter 9 was written about 100 years earlier, but it prophesies about events that are taking place around this time of Ezra and will be fulfilled ultimately 400 years later. And in Daniel 9, the Lord gave Daniel a sequence of events that leads up to the return of the king. Those events connect together and unfold on the day when Jesus rides the donkey into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Now, we're going to look at that in greater detail in another month or so when we look at Daniel chapter 9. But I mention that because we could pull all of these prophecies together from Daniel 9 to 1 Chronicles 17. We could start to understand why the crowds were so excited when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the donkey on Palm Sunday. You see, they were living out the fulfillment of these prophecies. They could see that God has been faithful all along, just as he was faithful to Abraham and just as he was faithful to bring the people out of Egypt, just as he was faithful to bring them into judgment because they were disobeying him. He was also faithful to bring about the restoration through this humble king now riding before them in the Jerusalem on this donkey. And so their king has arrived and he is the total literal fulfillment of God's promises to David here in 1 Chronicles 17. 
He was the king of peace. He was the posterity of David. God was his father, and the love of his father upon him was permanent. And Jesus now rides into Jerusalem to establish his perpetual, permanent kingdom that would have no end. And so this is just an amazing time of fulfilled prophecy. Now, as we head into what was sometimes called the Passion Week, when Jesus is then arrested and tried and crucified, the people had found out that the kingdom that Jesus had come to establish was not the kind of kingdom they wanted, and he was not the kind of king they wanted. And so they rejected their king, and they nailed him to a cross. But then, after he was resurrected, the Holy Spirit began helping people to see this was the plan all along. And thousands upon thousands of people realized that Jesus had come to establish a spiritual kingdom that included all of the nations. And they recognized the wrong that they had done, and they entered into a new covenant with Christ and committed to once again wait for his return. And so now the message of the kingdom is going out into all the world. It's been going out for 2,000 years. And this message is that the king is coming again, and he is inviting all of us from every nation, any nation, into fellowship with him. And if you are one of Christ's kingdom citizens, then you and I are waiting for his return to establish his kingdom, where we will enjoy the fulfillment of the promises that God first made to David here in 1042 BC in 1 Chronicles 17. And so that's this passage. What a great passage it is as it points us to our coming King. As we just wrap on up, let's just take some time just to praise Christ as our King. Let's make sure that we're ready for Him. You know, many of Christ's parables were not only about the kingdom, but about the fact that the kingdom citizens would have to wait for His return. And He warns them to be faithful, to continue to look for Him, to be ready for His return. And so as we just kind of finish out our time today, this is a great time just to remind ourselves of these truths that He is coming to renew our commitment to Him, to praise Him, and just to wait for His return. With that, we'll leave things there. Thanks again so much for listening. I look forward to catching with you more tomorrow. Have a great day. God bless.